Hello there, everybody. This is Mel Allen. Baseball is in its stretch run, and fans are flipping out. Front runners face the endurance test. The Red Sox run into the Yankees. The Angels make a run at the Royals. The Phillies run for daylight. The Cubs run out of gas. The Dodgers run the Giants out of town. And 39-year-old Jim Bowden makes one more run at the majors. Headlines and highlights coming up on This Week in Baseball. This series is just something that's completely different. I know that when I'm sitting on the bench, like last night and, and sometimes last year, and we're playing the Red Sox, uh, I just get full of fury or fury, and, and I just want, I want to beat the ball club as best, I, you know, just more than anything in the world, I guess. And I know that my time spent in Boston during the day in the hotel is thinking just primarily about beating the Boston Red Sox. Fenway Park in Boston, the Red Sox and New York Yankees. Act one of the September showdown for a supremacy in the American League East. New York had four days to work on a four-game Boston first place lead and wasted no time at all. In game one, two runs in the first inning, three in the second, two in the third, five in the fourth, and so it went. 15 runs all together and 21 base hits. The pattern was set for the entire series. A recurring nightmare for Boston. A batting orgy for New York. And the Yankees weren't after the long ball, just playing the field with a free-swinging singles party. 67 hits to the Red Sox 21. 42 runs to Boston's nine. And a 396 team batting average to the Sox 171. The most devastating Yankee assault on Beantown in 35 years. this Mickey Rivers three for three in one game and Willie Randolph three for three in another before Boston's number nine hitter even got to bat yes sir New York was ready Mickey Rivers pulled a hamstring and Thurman Munson was hit on the head by a pitch but both bounced right back Boston on the other hand entered the series hurting and it showed Nine-year-old Boston star really sparkled. But nothing could stop the Yankee onslaught. The pitcher just as ready as the hitters. And so 
were the fielders. New York swept all four games, moved into a tie for first place for the first time all year. Seven weeks earlier, when the Yankees trailed by 14 games, it seemed impossible. But when you're the world champions, you know it takes 162 games to win a title. As they say, the old cliche goes, it's so typical in baseball, every dog has his day. And I think that these are why men are men and why professionals are professionals. If they stick to it, you hang in there long enough and let the game just play itself, pretty soon things will turn around and your team will start playing exceptionally well, as the Yankees have. And with the talent we have, we always felt we could play this well anyway and give it a race, give the fans a chance to enjoy the New York Yankees and give the Boston Red Sox hell. And that's exactly what happened at Fenway Park. But Boston beat Baltimore the next night and had three more games to play in New York the next weekend. Still a scramble, but it'll be a long time before Fenway fans forget the shell shock of four rough days in September. Meanwhile, in the American League West, the California Angels discovered their share of blue skies in a critical four-game series with a team going for its third straight division crown. The Kansas City Royals. The Royals started off as if the title were theirs by divine right, smothering the California challenge. And since Mike makes right, Darrell Porter really got into the swing of things. There it is, going deep to center field, going, going, it is gone. This two-run blast helped boost the Royals three and a half games above the Angels, but there was little time to bask in the sun. Manager Jim Fregosa's Angels were doing a slow burn, but their fans were ready for them to catch fire, and suddenly everything started to pick up. second in the majors and homers, led the way, playing long ball and short ball, all with precision. Baylor hit two home runs in the last two games, and Kansas City hopes of burying the Angels went up in smoke. Speaking of smoke, Nolan Ryan chose the right time to rediscover his own. Amos Otis wants the ball over the plate. That's right, over the plate. And Mr. Ryan obliged. All in all, a big turn of events for the Angels, who took the last three games to snuggle within half a game of Kansas City at the crest of the West. Whether this was California's turning point will be known soon enough, but the Angels are clearly making their best bid ever to reach the nitty-gritty pay dirt of October. Pittsburgh's Dorian Boylan recently struck out in his first major league at bat while sitting on the bench. With two strikes on the rookie, Rennie Stennett pinch hit and struck out, but the strikeout was charged to Boylan. Now, can you name the last rookie to hit a homer in his first at bat? Stay tuned. In the National League, it was little more than a week ago that the Philadelphia Phillies kept looking behind to see who was creeping up as their Eastern Division lead dwindled. But now the Phils can rest a little bit easier after a most successful week. The Phillies at times this season have suffered a power drainage. 
But Mike Schmidt, Greg Luzinski, and company flipped a few switches with timely connections. And behold, Philadelphia power was quickly restored. While one challenger, the Pirates, was pushed back by the Mets, the other challenger, the Cubs, got swept by the Phils. Hey, get your hot franks. The Cubs manager may not have had a legitimate beef here, but who can blame him for laying on a little mustard? And who can blame the Phillies for feeling a sense of relief? Tug McGraw, the spirit of Philadelphia, goes right on with his top flight relief pitching. Recently, some have hinted of another installment of the 1964 Philadelphia Folderoo. Says who, said McGraw. Indeed who, now that Philadelphia's reopened its big lead. One Philly strong point is up the middle. Gary Maddox spins a web for center field flies. And while Bud Harrelson and Jim Morrison sit behind the doors, shortstop and second are laced in style. Larry Boa has covered everything. Second base, Ted Sizemore is back in step after injury. For those who question whether the Phils can carry the ball the rest of the way, one might answer it depends on what kind of game they play. If baseball, a qualified probably in a year of improbables. Out west, the Los Angeles Dodgers may have capped the lid against the rise of improbability in their division. Shooting for their second pennant in a row, the Dodgers are picking off opponents like skeet shooters. For most of the season, it appeared Los Angeles might be outraced by San Francisco's dark horse giants. But recently, the Dodgers pulled in the reins on their old rivals. Manager Joe Altabelli deserves plenty of credit for taking San Francisco this far and insists his young team will still be heard from. But all that could be heard was the blasting of Dodger bats, shaking up a tiring giant pitching staff. A two-game sweep in Los Angeles. And then, the next week, two more in San Francisco. Actually, right now, the Dodgers don't care who they play. Take Houston. Burt Hooten did for victory number 17. Six straight and 12 of 14. Or Atlanta where 39-year-old Jim Bouton made his first big league appearance in eight years. For three innings, it appeared his unlikely comeback might be not so unlikely. <laughs> then the Dodgers routed him for six runs moving straight ahead with their September pennant drive. Steve Garvey, as dependable as California sunshine, went five for five and drove in his 100th run. A few weeks ago, a clash between Garvey and Don Sutton challenged Dodger Harmony. But Garvey keeps hitting, Sutton keeps winning, and the Dodgers keep moving. As a matter of probability, it appears the Dodgers' next challenge may come in October. Who was the last player to hit a homer in his first Major League at bat? The answer, Toronto's Al Woods. It happened one year ago in the Blue Jays' very first Major League game. ballpark. Now how about this for a seventh inning stretch? It may not be the Olympics, but the track is fast and fractures. 
Repeat with happy feet. Safe or out? Call for a praying chicken. These are troubled times. Next thing you know, we'll see a praying mantis. Praying for what? Ah, but it's still the good old game where one bad turn. Deserves another. Don't hang it up. Keep on. Show a little faith. It can move airplanes. Or stop them. Even paper airplanes. Baseball works in mysterious ways. It's not for one to reason why or how. a world without reason. What reason for this? Or this? Or this? Just remember to keep on laughing. It's the law. It sounds like, even looks like, an ending. But what about our marathon man? There he is in the home stretch. Thank goodness someone stayed on the right track. And right on track was Detroit's Ron LaFleur with a 27-game hitting streak, longest in the American League this season. It ended, though, in this game, thanks or no thanks to Yankee Jay Johnstone. Now more grand larceny, the Giants' Darrell Evans and the compass Mike Ivey. Cincinnati's smooth-sailing shortstop, Dave Concepcion. Second base, Oriole Rich Dower. Also at second, Blue Jay, Dave McKay. And finally, Yankee outfielder Lou Pinella. Actually, Sweet Lou prefers the ground around home, where he's really swinging. I have a good feel for what's happening at home plate, and uh, the last couple of years I've hit the ball very well. I've always been a, a 300 hitter one year, and uh, 275, 280, 285 hitter the next. Uh, maybe I can put the back, back to back 200, 300 years this year. And this week, the Gillette Special goes to Lou Pinella. 
for leading New York's offensive charge in Boston's Fenway Park against the Red Sox. Fenella had 10 hits and 16 at-bats for a 625 average. Drove in five runs. Some kind of show. Congratulations, Lou. That's all for now, folks. See you next week on This Week in Baseball.